welcome to IFAB Online. My name is Martin Kaufman. I've been in fundraising for 30 years. I've run programs for the UK's National Trust, the London School of Economics, the Hackney Empire Theatre and the Museum of London. And I was campaign director for the Terracotta Warriors exhibition at National Museums Liverpool in 2017 to 18. Since 2013, I've worked as a strategic consultant in culture and education as the principal of Martin Kaufman Philanthropy. I have worked on overseas cultural fundraising projects that include Sweden, the PTO School of Music, where I went up to the Arctic Circle every month for three years, in Switzerland, the Werner Erstlich Library in Canada, the Royal British Columbia Museum in Vancouver, in Germany, in Munich, the Halberstadt Organ, and in the UK, when I was Director of Development of the Architectural Association, I organized what may have been the first international alumni telephone, and I also did overseas fundraising in Hong Kong and Malaysia. And at the Museum of London, where I was development director, my team managed the Harcourt Group. They were an international group of donors based in London. Over nine years, they supported the museum with 450,000 in membership subscriptions. But when you add in the extra donations and the sponsorship they gave, that 450,000 leveraged a total of six million pounds for the museum. Now we took our Harcourt patrons on tours. First of all, we had the director's tours. We went to Berlin, Moscow, Havana, Damascus, and Vienna. Here's a photograph of us in Cuba. And I have to say, I took this photograph. It is extremely difficult. It's like herding cats to get a crowd of very happy, fairly wealthy people all together in one go. We also had family tours. In fact, we were the only um, organization uh, or, uh, doing pat patron tours for children. And we went to Rome, Cairo and Luxor, Athens, Hadrian's Wall and Viking Denmark. Here's a picture I took outside uh, the pyramids on the Sphinx. We'd actually taken this toilet paper with us in order to undergo these children with a, an Egyptian mummification ritual. The tourists nearby were amazed. What general lessons have I learned from the type of work I've done overseas for culture? First of all, that desk research plus face-to-face -face research is absolutely essential for understanding cultural differences. You need to be very respectful of cultural and religious differences, political differences. Don't be opportunist. Don't just pretend to be on their side. They'll see through you and you will feel uncomfortable. You need to learn from your mistakes. You will make mistakes and don't be embarrassed to get things wrong. And it's better to be cautiously neutral to avoid the pitfalls, but don't be boring either. Do your homework about people, places and things, but ask your donors and supporters about their views on their culture and don't show off. And lastly, don't be afraid of asking for support, but get advice from what I call a wise old owl somebody who knows the culture, knows the organization, to see whether it's culturally appropriate for you yourself to ask, and also about the timing of asking. Now, the main part of my presentation today for IFAB online is a case study in raising funds with China-related cultural artifacts. And I want to share this experience with you as I believe it crystallizes many of these general lessons from other organizations and countries I've worked in. Now, many of you here at IFAB may have a variety of experiences in China-related fundraising. Maybe you're working in mainland China or in Hong Kong. Maybe you're partnering with UK organizations in China or Hong Kong, or maybe you support Chinese and Hong Kong cultural projects in the UK or elsewhere. Maybe you're working with Chinese communities and organizations in the UK or elsewhere, or do you just want to assess the opportunities and the risks of working in China-related fundraising. Now, there will be some general lessons for all of you in this case study of the Terracotta Warriors Exhibition in National Museums, Liverpool, 2017 to 18. I hope you find it useful. And it would be good to know in the question and answer session afterwards and in your feedback to the organizers, what do you think are the biggest issues in China-related fundraising? I'm gonna tell you mine, please let me know yours. So let's just talk about 
the whole background in China to philanthropy and sponsorship. In summary, between 2010 and 2016, donations from the top 100 philanthropists in mainland China totaled $4.6 billion. And annual donations from all sources to charities in China grew from 10 billion renminbi to 100 billion renminbi between 2009 and 2018. Interestingly, 80% of donations in China come from corporations, and the majority of Chinese philanthropy is focused inside China, not outside it. And on the cultural side, it's really important to realize there has been an enormous growth in museums in China, across China, many of them privately philanthropically sponsored. And China is set to be the leading global center for art. For instance, the Centre Pompidou set up the West Bund Museum project in Shanghai in 2019. However, there are also very large UK organizations involved in China, and I'm just gonna highlight three of them. First of all, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the world's number one design museum. Secondly, the University of Liverpool, and obviously that's uh, important in terms of the Terracotta Warriors. And thirdly, the University of Nottingham. Now, the universities of Nottingham and Liverpool have campuses in mainland China, and also 5,000 students from China are actually based in Liverpool. The Victoria and Albert Museum has had major engagement for years in many areas, and that includes between 2005 and 2013, five major exhibitions with China-related themes, and in China itself, more than 13 exhibitions, strong commercial and diplomatic relationships, including the UK-China Cultural Exchange, alongside the British Library, the British Museum, and the Tate in 2016, and travel with the VNA program organized a 2010 trip to China for museum supporters led by VNA curators. Uh, I don't know the details of that, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's not that dissimilar to the Museum of London tours that I've already told you about. Now, this is the uh, China's first emperor and the terracotta warriors front page branding. And I'll also show you, this is the wonderful catalog of the exhibition richly um, illustrated with the fantastic artifacts. I'll tell you more about the artifacts in a minute. For those of you who don't know, China was united uh, under the first emperor, under the first emperor of the Qin dynasty. And uh, there were about seven kingdoms that he conquered and brought together. And his tomb at Xi'an is probably the number one archeological discovery of the 20th century. Now, why Liverpool? Well, Liverpool has a very long relationship to China. Liverpool is the site of the oldest Chinese community in Europe. From the 1840s onwards, there would be Chinese sailors coming to Liverpool on the, in the boats of the Liverpool China merchants. Many of them settled down and over years, the, the uh, community grew. This is the actual imperial arch in, built in the 20th in the early 20th century, um, sorry, the early 21st century uh, in Liverpool's Chinatown. And it's probably the, the largest imperial arch outside China and maybe uh, it, it, it's bigger than many of those inside China. Look at the difference. Can you tell the difference between Shanghai's waterfront on the Bund and Liverpool's waterfront? On the left-hand side, we have the Bund in Shanghai, and on the right, we have Liverpool's waterfront. There's some interesting differences and some interesting similarities there. And inside our, um, that is National Museum's Liverpool, um, Museum of Liverpool, one of the main museums of the National Museum group, we actually have a Shanghai, China, Liverpool gallery, and it's full of artifacts that the China merchants brought back from the Far East into Liverpool, but also it has wonderful displays about the lives and history of the Chinese community in Liverpool. And this is World Museum, which is probably the most important museum in the National Museum's Liverpool group. And World Museum is where the Terracotta Warriors exhibition opened in February, 2018, and it closed in October, 2018. Now, what did we actually get with the Terracotta Warriors exhibition? 
Every year, China sends two terracotta warriors exhibitions around the world. Well, I doubt if they're doing that this year, but before 2020. One circulates in Asia and the rest, the other one circulates in Europe um, and the Americas and also Africa. The Chinese authorities give you two basic choices for the type of exhibition you want. Do you want one that's concentrated on the terracotta warriors tomb or do you want a broader historical one? National Museums of Liverpool chose the broader historical one. So we, we in our exhibition showed the whole history that led up to the unification of China by the Qin Emperor, and then the collapse of the Qin Dynasty and the rise of the Han Dynasty. Because what's interesting about the Han Dynasty is that it took over all of the structures, the legal and cultural artifacts and policies of the, of the Qin, and in fact, what we think of as Chinese culture today was defined by Han culture. So our exhibition spanned 700 or so years. It typified what everybody thinks is Chinese culture. And this is an interesting point because the Chinese Communist Party see the Terracotta Warriors exhibitions going around the world as an aspect of their soft power and actually talking about uh, what it is to be Chinese. And this picture, for instance, is of the golden horse of Mao Ling. And it was a late arrival in the exhibition, which is quite exciting because we could have a second private view for when it arrived. We had the most fantastic success in this exhibition. We had 605,000 visitors. This was far and away the largest exhibition that National Museums of Liverpool had ever had, more than double the size. You can see the, the uh, statistics there. I'll point you to the bubble in the bottom right-hand corner, 31,119 replica warriors were sold, but 10 full-size replicas were sold in the shop for 1,200 pounds each. Goodness gracious. And we had an absolute blitz on media coverage, on press and publicity in general. And on top of that, through a working with a wonderful marketing and communications team of about three people nearly all the time, we got fantastic social media and other coverage. So for instance, six and a half million people reached on social media. These are all important uh, aspects of how the museum was successful and why it wanted to do this and why fundraising to support it was also important. Now, this is me. And I'm not showing you just a photograph of me for the sake of myself, because you can see me on the screen. But this is the me the day before the exhibition opened. I was privileged enough to be in a completely empty gallery, apart from the person taking the photograph. And here are seven of the 10 warriors that were in the exhibition. China only ever allow 10 warriors out at, when, at one time. We had about 120 objects. As I said, they stretched from what's called the Warring Kingdoms period right up to the Han Dynasty, but the center was this display. You will not see this type of display again because unfortunately, only two months before we opened our exhibition at the, uh, the Franklin Museum in Philadelphia, a Christmas reveler broke across the barrier and snapped off one of the terracotta warriors fingers in that exhibition in Philadelphia to absolute uproar and outrage. Um, he, is, uh, he was uh, arrested. He actually took the finger home and he, he's had two, two trials and his retrial has been postponed because of coronavirus. And in a nutshell, the museum is uh, Franklin Museum. I'm sure if I haven't got the name quite right, is in a dispute over four and a half million dollars with the Chinese archaeological authorities over this finger. So here you could almost touch the terracotta warriors. You will not be able to do that again, sadly. So let's look at planning the exhibition. Um, this was a long and con 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 convoluted process. The informal agreement started in early 2015. Then we recruited a Chinese consultant to manage the relationships on the ground in Xi'an, where the terracotta warriors are. His involvement was absolutely critical, but I have to say, although it couldn't have been done without him, it's a very, very, very expensive process. We're talking about 
a six-figure process to get a consultant to make this work, but we couldn't have done it without him. The choice of artifacts for loan was unfortunately only finalized in summer 2017, and the Chinese authorities prohibited any publicity whatsoever on the specific objects until the export license was agreed. And that wasn't agreed to the end of the year. So this is very challenging for producing fundraising materials. As an example, we were all ready to uh, film a video with interviews and, and images that we thought were all right, but we got the, the, the thumbs down on that and we weren't allowed to do it. And the formal agreement for uh, the exhibition, although it's made in November 2016 and I was recruited in December 2016 and started working in February 2017, um, 11 days a month till February 2018, that's not a long time for a, a museum to organize an exhibition of this scale and for fundraising to take place. These were very short timescales. Most exhibitions of this scale would have two years lead time at least. So in summary, there was no advanced fundraising preparation. There had been nobody running the NML development department since 2015. And the NML, that's National Museums in Liverpool, decided not to undertake any preparation work for a fundraising campaign until the contract for the exhibition was signed off with China in November 2016. Now, what was the result of that um, lack of advanced preparation? First of all, there was no fundraising case for support ready to be used. Secondly, there was no preparatory prospect research undertaken. Thirdly, no market testing of donors to agree an achievable fundraising target. Fourthly, no volunteer fundraising committee set up. And lastly, no effective coordination with other major Liverpool cultural event events taking place in 2018. Um, there were two big events taking place in 2018. Therefore, there's an immediate lesson to be learned. Major exhibition fundraising must be planned well in advance, even with the risk that the exhibition itself will not take place. Given the complexities involved with fundraising around a China project, the need for advanced planning is more acute than usual. I would say it would have been the right thing to have started fundraising preparation six months before the contract was signed. If it didn't happen, it didn't happen, but it would have been better to have done it then. This is one of the rooms that we used during the exhibition that was refurbished in the run-up to the exhibition. This is the entrance to the old technical school, which is now part of uh, World Museum. It's a beautiful marble uh, Edwardian gallery, and we use this for dinners and for receptions. And here we've, we've colored it, we've lit it with, with Chinese red. We engaged with lots of organizations involved with China. And here's the types of organizations we engaged with. Chinese companies doing business in the UK and their Chinese or UK senior staff. The Chinese embassy in order to give a lead to China oriented businesses to support the exhibition. The Chinese consulate in Manchester with their influence over Chinese communities in the Northwest. The Chinese communities themselves in the Liverpool city region, not just in Liverpool. UK-based organizations working with China to promote China-UK trade and investment, and the UK government, especially digital culture, media and sport, DCMS, and, who, and the supporters of the Great Britain campaign. And last but certainly not least, the UK embassy and the British Council itself in Beijing. Just to show you, these are a couple of our major donors. On the left is Wendy Wu of Wendy Wu Travel, and in the middle, is the senior representative of uh, Tianjin Airlines in the UK. We also therefore look for UK supporters. We look for UK businesses already working in China, individuals and businesses who wanted an opportunity to get involved with China, UK donors who had links with China, charitable trusts, companies and individuals, and existing National Museums of Liverpool supporters, and Liverpool-based companies who wanted connections to a major public relations and educational success story in their own city. In total, we had a prospect list of approximately 200 companies, trusts and individuals. This is one of my favorite photographs actually. It's, it's not particularly relevant, but I'd like to put it in because this is on the private view and it shows the then culture secretary, 
but it show it shows one, two, three, one, two, three, four mayors of the Merseyside region, all with their chains of office. And I I invented a a collective noun for mayors, a clanking of mayors. I loved it. So what was successful in the campaign? First of all, we raised 450,000 plus, but that included Tianjin Airlines, the largest NML sponsor ever. We deepened relations with Unilever and with Swire, which was actually founded in Liverpool. We effectively used the high level contacts of the museum's director, the executive director and key trustees. One in particular, um, who was the trustee responsible for, uh, for fundraising, Ian Rosenblatt. We created new relationships inside and outside Merseyside for subsequent follow-up. We transformed, I would say, NML senior staff and trustees perception of fundraising. We put donor and sponsor relations center stage around providing benefits and recognition. We created a group of trustees actively involved in fundraising throughout most of the, of the pro progress of the campaign. And we engaged eternal, external campaign ambassadors to work at a senior level. We raised the ambitions of the development team alongside the growth of its longer term strategy. I'll come on to that a bit later. The whole thing I would say would, was a step change in National Museum Liverpool fundraising, side by side with the highest profile exhibition ever. And just to show you, in fact, in our um, exhibition catalog, we have all the major donors and sponsors listed. So we had headline partners, keynote partners, major partners, and Terracotta Warriors partners. Headline partners were around 200,000 pounds up. Keynote partners were about 100,000 pounds plus up. Major partners were about 50,000 pounds plus up. And Terracotta Warrior partners were 10,000 pounds, 25,000. So you can see from here, actually, there weren't a great number of, of actual donors and sponsors. Each one of them took a lot of work. And of course, there were others who, who supported at a lower level as well. But one of the most important things I'd like to say in this presentation for IFAV, there are four big challenges relating to China-related organizations that hampered us from being even more successful than we might have been. Challenge number one, the process of getting the final agreement for the exhibition severely hampered our, fun hampered our fundraising opportunities. The Chinese cultural attache had told us when he came around the museum in August 2017, that the embassy would be very pleased to give active support to get businesses to support us, but only once the export license was granted. Now we were on a knife edge for several months. That was August 2017. The license only arrived in December 2017, believe it or not, two months before opening. The late delivery of the export license completely scuffered us getting formal endorsement from the embassies among, uh, embassy amongst Chinese UK companies in time for the start of the exhibition. And two volunteer campaign ambassadors stressed to us that we must get embassy support before approaching China-oriented companies. This is a very interesting one that I've reflected on a lot. As a result, we spent a great deal of time and held back from making some independent contacts because of concern that we would be rebuffed without, without the embassy's support. Should we have taken a more independent view and taken greater risks? That's an interesting question. Challenge number two was that political sensitivities around the museum's collection posed one I can only describe as an existential threat to the exhibition. Now, Tibetan displays in the World Museum in Liverpool are amongst the most important outside Tibet. And there is amongst them a prominent visual reference to the Dalai Lama and that describes the Chinese state as an occupier. These are descriptions and exhibition uh, displays that go back, I suspect, 10, 15 more years. National Museums Liverpool decided that it was not appropriate to act in advance on the prior concerns that three of us expressed, a trustee, a senior staff member and myself, about mitigating the risk of the exhibition by these particular positions on Tibet and China. In early January 2018, that's uh, uh, shortly after we received the, uh, the export license, 
we had a visit by the Manchester Chinese vice consul and his assistant to see these displays. I can only describe this as the one of the two most embarrassing moments of my whole 30 year fundraising career. We showed the Manchester Chinese vice consul and his assistant round and we'd been talking in English to them. And I could see we were approaching this particularly sensitive and quite challenging uh, display about uh, the Chinese in Tibet. The Chinese vice consul and his assistant stopped talking English and started talking Chinese and taking notes for five minutes. We then came back to our uh, uh, the director's office where we received a lecture actually with where we were given books on Tibetan China which we should read and the Chinese vice consul said that these exhibitions cannot be opened during the exhibition. The implied threat was that if you do open them, we will not send you the terracotta warriors. Now, NML had to balance its own independence and its collecting and displays policies against the danger that the whole exhibition might be pulled. We'd already spent an enormous amount of money, time, staff resource, and done a lot of fundraising to get where we'd got to. Because the world culture, however, was already overdue for refurbishment and a redisplay, it was therefore closed for the duration of the exhibition. This is a decision with internal risks, but it actually didn't create any public disapproval. But it was, I have to say, touch and go. Third challenge was working with our lead Chinese partner in what I can describe as an opaque and time-consuming decision-making process. Tianjin Airlines was a key supporter but their own marketing needs changed frequently. And while we engaged with the UK team, we were prevented from directly contacting the decision makers in China. They had a provisional agreement on the partnership, which was substantially delayed by alterations outside our control, and in fact, probably outside their control to airline licenses allocated by the Chinese government. And then in the UK, Tianjin Airlines decided to move its hub from London Gatwick to London Heathrow. Lots of change, and subsequently a new senior manager in China ratcheted up to a much tougher negotiating stance with frequent changes, referring back to changes in their operational policy as a result of Chinese government de decisions. The initial approach to, to Tianjin Airlines took place in April 2017, but the partnership was only finalized, signed, cashed the, through the door in October 2018, which is at the end of the display, at the end of the exhibition, despite the airline being prioritized in all publicity before and after the opening. As a result, the financial agreement was financially much lower than initially discussed. It still ended up as the largest single NML sponsorship of 215,000 pounds. But the lesson here is dealing with a company, even a Chinese company based in the UK, with, which is controlled by China and having to deal with emails with China and with emails and meetings in the UK is difficult. The, the, it is not an easy process. Challenge number four, two parallel NML fundraising strategies hampered major gift engagement with China. The Terracotta Warriors campaign was set up in early 2017 specifically, not only to um, raise money for the Terracotta Warriors, but to be a, an engine of growth for major donors, for major, fifth, major gift fundraising with me as campaign director. But later on in 2017, the NML board endorsed a parallel strategy led by the new director of Deven development, Andrew Evans, a very, very good strategy. And by the way, Andrew and I worked very closely on the whole campaign and he has uh, endorsed much of what has been said today in this presentation. He, was set, he had been tasked to set out a long-term operational base, which included strengthening revenue fundraising and revitalizing membership. But, 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 there was a strategy mismatch between the major gifts and the rev revenue fundraising strategy. And that ended up dispelling senior management enthusiasm for what I considered would be a groundbreaking exhibition partnership with Wendy Wu Travel. 
this would develop, have developed a patron's tour to China program based on my Museum of London experience of major gift growth, which would have used the experience of NML in China to grow not only major donors, but also mid-level mid donors, and then to be replicated later on with other exhibitions. So, sadly, competing strategies implemented by the same development team, reporting into two separate people, ended up with a missed opportunity in a bemused sponsor. I cannot go into extreme details about how that happened. All I can say is that didn't happen with the active agreement of either myself or Andrew Evans. I think it was more about the fact that it just happened. So those are the challenges. What are the lessons that have been learned? Much of what we did was under uh, Theresa May's government and their rapprochement with China, following on in particular from uh, Cameron's uh, visit with uh, the chairman Xi. Lesson number one, Western oriented fundraising needs to develop a radically different cultural approach when dealing with fundraising around China. We're working within a highly centralized and hierarchical economic and political system. And that results in the more junior levels not wanting to lose face in delivering messages from their senior levels to sponsors and donors and to clients in effect like ourselves. This can make it very difficult for Western oriented fundraisers to judge discussions, negotiations and outcomes accurately. Western oriented fundraisers need to receive specific training in understanding Chinese political and business cultural practice. We did receive some, but I had to learn most of it on the job. And as I've described in terms of the whole issue around um, not having the embassies public support us in terms of getting businesses on board because we didn't have the, the export license, it can be a real challenge. I'll throw in here because it refers to the next point, two of the wonderful and senior members of the Chinese community in Liverpool on the day that we gave um, a, 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 an hour and a half's preview of the opening and everybody got a, uh, a special ticket on the day, which they're showing there. Lesson number two is you need to make friends with China watchers and with Chinese communities in your own country. We engaged with the China Britain Business Council and we recruited campaign ambassadors who were working for Chinese companies. Each of them helped us greatly in contacts and in business etiquette. In order to ensure that National Museums of Liverpool staff engaged in the base, best possible way with Chinese business people and Liverpool Chinese communities, we arranged Chinese cultural awareness training from a local Merseyside Chinese community leader. And we did the following. We engaged with 18 community organizations in a special exhibition preview a month or two before the exhibition opened. We involved Liverpool Chinese school children and cultural organizations in the private view, including a wonderful dragon dance. We held a special viewing for Merseyside Chinese community leaders on the opening morning in advance of the general public, which I've just told you about. We didn't assume that the Chinese community in our city was monolithic. For a start, there are 5,000 mainland Chinese students there, and there is a Confucius Institute in the University of Liverpool. We didn't assume that they were monolithic, especially in their political views. They were not, but all of them were immensely proud of the exhibition. And here is a picture of the Chinese ambassador uh, on the opening afternoon tea. We actually had three events on the opening day. We had a lunch, an afternoon tea, and then the evening private view, which was um, very, very, very crowded. Lesson number three. An extremely robust but pragmatic ethical stance is required. Yes, 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 yes. Engaging with the, the Chinese archaeological authorities at Xi'an was in effect a government to government issue. In our campaign brochure, which is here, we featured the, yen, the then UK Cultural Secretary Karen Bradley in Xi'an with the authorities side by side with our executive director. We were invited to Lancaster House in December 2017, 
Lancaster House, for those who don't know about it, is, is in effect the main government um, high status reception uh, centre in London. We were invited to Lancaster House for the people to people discussions between the UK and China. We actually had an exhibition stand there and the exhibition was lauded, lauded by senior UK politicians and Chinese government officials. Whilst we work closely with the, departure, the, the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and with the British Embassy in China, we actually felt unable, the leadership of this campaign in NML, to share our concerns about our Tibetan displays with them. We felt that DCMS would then have been obliged if we'd shared that information or our concerns to bring that issue into government to government relations between the UK and China. We felt that we couldn't take that chance. My general conclusion and the lesson is to raise funds around Chinese artifacts, UK cultural organizations should really try to avoid commenting and all the things that we in the UK may not like about what we consider often a repressive regime. We should concentrate instead on the positive benefits of sharing cultural treasures between the countries. Thank you so much. And I look forward very much to uh, having the questions and answer sessions and also dealing with the feedback, which I understand is over the next 12 months. I do hope you've had a great time, learnt a lot on iFab online. See you next year. Bye-bye.